Hello, my name's Daniel. I live in Texas, and uh, it really is an honor to ask you a question. I um I remember reading my nursing theory in fundamentals, and you were you were one of the theorists that I actually understood early on. <laughs> and so, it, it, um, I can tell I'm already rambling, so I'll I'll just jump to the question, or I guess the comment here. Um, you know, I, I like so many things that you said, just uh, bringing love back into a science and reminding that we have a professional calling, uh, that nurses should be asking, why are we nurses and why are we here? Uh, there's there's such a deeper connection uh, to why we show up uh, into hospitals and outside of hospitals to, to perform the mission that we believe in. Uh, one of the things that I thought was was honestly profound, and if you've said this before and I just missed it, that's a testament of my attention span. But um, when you said we're reducing uh, a person to a patient and then we reduce a, a patient to a case or to a bed or what whatnot. And, you know, I, I kind of wrote it from a case to a, a, a widget or a count or something like that. I. I I think about the bedside nurse, and that is that's something that they're very good about going. I'm not doing that, and and I applaud those bedside nurses for being so fierce in what they do. But then I I empathize for the nurse leaders uh, in today's world because there's a balance between having to stand uh, in the human connection of what nursing is, but also being clinically competent to all not clinically competent, operationally competent to all the statistics and information that comes. And I think naturally I look at my young, my early career and I go like, well, that's when I would talk about, well, the patient experience stat says this, or the productivity stat says this, or the margin says this. Do you have any comment on um, just the, how we uh, continue as uh, leaders of leaders uh, to ensure that that we're helping our um, our frontline nurse leaders come back to their true north. I don't think they cannot be competent in those skills. I don't think they get to ignore them. Um, but I do think uh, we we could I could do better in uh, caring for them and and you know I wrote being in the moment with them, walking alongside them in their journey. So, uh, any comments to that? Well, thank you for your comments and your wise interpretation and, and question, because I think what we're challenged with is moving between paradigms is part of the finesse that's required. And as you have uh, leaders that have the language and the consciousness to know another way is needed in order to support the staff nurses and mediate between all of those external forces and the human dimensions of care through these macro and micro practices of caring that come from the leader as well as the grassroots nurse. That's a, We have a program called the Caritas Leadership Program, which also provides that kind of perspective to actually change our ways of being a leader. And it's also, as you mentioned, it's really moving from doing nursing to being a nurse and then having the support of the system to able to experiment with new models or new practice models, new demonstration projects. Some of the ways that we've been so successful is by not only a whole system taking on this own, but also sometimes at a unit level and just do the demonstration. We had a project early on at Children's Hospital in Denver and where we created the attending caring team model it started out as an attending caring nurse and ended up being attending caring team and included all the other team members who wanted to participate. But what happened was in the beginning, it was a very distressed unit. There was a 36% turnover weight by year two or no year two, it was like 16%. By year three, it dropped down to 6%. And some of those that had left had gone back to school and uh, or gone to other units in the hospital to replicate the model. So this is an example of how leadership can create space for something new to happen at the, by changing the patterns of delivery of care. So you get away from that industrial model. It's, it takes 
bravery, but it takes a consciousness and knowledge of another way of supporting nursing. And not just nursing, it's nurse, it, you're, when you have the language to articulate and give voice and language to another option, another opportunity to support the whole, you're actually improving the whole system. And even with the magnet process, there's a difference between some of their criteria and what you might think of in a caring science framework, because it's still an institutional practice model versus a professional practice model. You know, it's, it's these are subtleties, but it's a deeper level of understanding what it is that we're doing. And we have a responsibility to lift this up. And once you can start inv inviting other people in, it's it's where it has to be because this current system cannot survive. It's broken and we know it's broken and we keep trying to fix it up with all these little things, you know, the scripting model or changing the, the, the hospitality model, but that doesn't change it. It has to be the people have to be elevated to support. You have to create a space where nurses can practice nursing. I go on and on, so I'll, I'll be quiet. But thank you for your comments. Other questions or comments? Thank you, Jean. My name is Jason Plamond, and I'm a chief nurse at Seaside Hospital on the North Coast here in Oregon. Oh, great. Um, I think, you know, uh, as per usual, Jennifer Gentry got us ready for this conversation last night. Uh, with some great dialogue and conversation uh, uh, about this very situation that you're talking about. And I think I'd love to hear from you. I think part of what we discussed at our table last night was we've been in crisis mode. Uh, we've been in crisis mode for probably three years now. So if we're not, uh, and you know, when you study what, what how the brain kind of works in crisis mode, you're not thinking ahead. You're just trying to survive that shift. How will we survive this day? And I think it's uh, maybe two months ago was the first time I realized, oh, this is the first year that I've actually sat down and wrote out priorities for our team, right? Like, because we just haven't had the breathing room for that. And the runway for that breathing room is very short for us because we, we're probably going to go into contract negotiations very soon again. And we, we anticipate that that might be contentious. Um, Yes. So, so saying that, I think what I'm starting to realize is there, there may not be, this may be kind of our new, uh, the new way that th things happen for us. So how do we, even in crisis mode, there's gotta be a way for us to still, uh, connect, uh, on that human level, uh, as you discussed, um, and, and provide a space for our caregivers to do the same. Like, how do we, I guess, how do we do that in our new normal, right? I, I think that's my question. Well, I think for me, you have to have vision as consciousness. You have to invite and inspire people with a bigger vision and helping them to see what they already have to offer. And when people are working on together on something greater than themselves that inspires them and shares the consciousness, it invites a whole different transformation from within. And I'm really serious about language defines us. Words bring us into meaning, into world. So using a different language and inviting people into caring science and uplifting the medical science because that's inadequate. Medical science is not based on any core philosophy or values or theories or language that embraces the evolution of humanity and humans are evolving. The public knows more about what they need than we do because we're still so trapped in that industrial model and nurse leaders know another way. So part of your challenge is to give voice and language at that table and we have hospitals that are now at that big visionary level where they actually are care task coaches. Like at Stanford Health, Dale Beatty is one of the advocates for this and doing all these different things throughout the grassroots of the system, bringing caring science, not just to nursing, but to the broader, all the other health practitioners. So it's, it's a vision as consciousness, inviting others in, giving voice and language and affirming what people are already doing and creating space where they can do it more creatively, more beautifully, more coherently. 
And you can do that as a leader. That's why you're there. That's why you're here. Thank you. And let us help you. You know, Watson Caring Science said, that's why that's why I exist. That's why I'm here. You know, like why are we here? You know, we all have this existential question. Maybe it's a spiritual, like, why did I come? Why am I here? Well, I know why I'm here is to help do this, to change this this really uh, sick system that we have, which denies their humanity. So God bless. <laughs> and you and you can do it. Stay in touch with us. Let us help us. Hi. Uh, Jean, this is Lori Green. I'm the chief nursing officer. At hey, Jean, I'm Lori Green. I'm the chief nursing officer from Providence, Portland. Um, two things. One, I, I want to deeply thank you for coming today. Um, those of us on the planning committee knew a little bit ahead of time you were coming, and uh, we kind of freaked out. We were so excited. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, um, I've had the honor of uh studying your theory twice. And um, the one thing that you said today is the power of being seen, whether that's our patients or our caregivers. Um, and I had an opportunity to give probably the most amazing DAISY award to a caregiver, to a nurse who was nominated by a fiance of a patient. And it was really all about them feeling seen. It was beautiful. And it wasn't necessarily a happy story uh, for the patient. And the nurse, as I was reading her story, kept saying, I didn't know anybody noticed what I was doing, oh, didn't see me. Wow. Exactly. And so you yeah. talk about the power of seeing a patient or their family member, but yes. the power of seeing that nurse. Exactly. And I just wanted to share that with you. Well, thank you. And I have something to share with you about the DAISY Award, because we are now in partnership with the DAISY Foundation, and they are now at Stanford and at Kaiser Permanente. They are now developing those five items of the CARETAS measures are now the new criteria that are being used to nominate a nurse as a DAISY. And we've done research showing that the DAISY Award narratives, in every single one we analyzed, there's evidence of the CARETAS processes. So a DAISY nurse is a CARETAS nurse as evidence. So do you want new forms of evidence? Your DAISY awardees would be a form of evidence uh, to help supporting and to show that you have theory underpinning your DAISY nominations, even though they may not know it. So the, like Stanford now, they're starting to now highlight, okay, this is evidence of care Caring science and the CARETAS processes through the DAISY nominations. And I was there last year when they had their awards and I listened to every single one. And of course I identified all the CARETAS processes in their own experiences. So this is the kind of evolution that's happening. The other thing I wanna say about the listening or the uh, being seen, it, not just the patient being seen, but the nurses to be seen and the nurses to be heard. And there was a, a national listening project uh, during the pandemic, a national nursing listening project. And the, there were about five themes that were uh, detected in these nurses listening to nurses about the pandemic. And one of them was um, prepare me, protect me, support me and care for me. There were five and I can't remember all of them, but those were sort of, but, oh, listen, the first one was hear me, hear me, protect me, prepare me, support me and care for me. So you know, subtleties, subtleties that are needed by the nurses as well as the patients. So we forget our own human needs. And so that's where I think you as a leader can actually you know, embrace this even more fully, which I'm sure you're already doing but it really highlights the importance of this. These are basic human things. There's nothing new about any of this. We sort of already know this, don't we? Hi, Jean, this is David Stowers. I'm over our care management teams uh, within the central division here at Providence. And like Daniel said earlier, it's kind of surreal sitting here talking with you, um, learning, you know, uh, back when we were in nursing school and, and talking <laughs> about your theory and it was between you and Dorothea Orem, I think were the two, the two uh, main theorists that we we studied in school. So uh, it's nice to meet you and 
talk to you in person. Um, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about or get your feedback on how we bridge. You know, a lot of care is moving outside the hospital. And I don't just mean home health. I'm talking about just overall overarching, you know, um, care of the, the person, you know, the human caring aspects and, and people in the environment that they live in, not so much the four walls of our hospital. And, and really, you know, I, I have a lot of caregivers that are just, you know, see things and uh, are distraught with uh, some of the things they're seeing in the, the community and taking care of patients in, in where they live. And I just wanted to just get your thoughts on, you know, let's just go beyond, you know, the traditional healthcare like we know it and where we're going with, you know, home out into where, you know, people live and where they, you know, do business and where they're struggling sometimes to even make ends meet that is impacting their, their, their healthcare. And, and what happens is they end up in our ERs as a result of these things that we're seeing out in the community. So I really want to just get your thought on just going beyond, you know, our, our traditional for one right. model of the hospital. Yeah. Right, new things are evolving and spanning out because it really at another level, as I suggested, it's a post-hospital era is emerging. And you talk about being futuristic. And so, you know, people are moving. I mean, nurses are moving into the community even when they le left for the pandemic. So it is really a, an era of, of change. And so within these communities, you, well, I'll put it another way. It's been noted that when nurses, nursing moved into hospitals, nurses lost control of their practice. So when nurses go back into the community, sort of the foundation of nursing, then you'll find evidence of the opportunity for nurses to practice nursing, what we're talking about. So by having this transition, and if the hospital has these clinics or the hospital is moving into the home, there should be a continuity and coming up with new models of care. I mean, even in my PhD program, I, I, I did this worry of preparatory to stress for surgery. So I made home visits to prepare the child and a family before the child came to the hospital so they would know what to expect and then followed them back into the home. It's that kind of possibility that you're gonna be moving from even your current role in the hospital, you might be taking it out into the community or into the home. But there's also the emergence between academic and clinical partners that are happening where nurses are establishing these clinics in these areas where there's homeless and so forth. So that's a part of our mission, if you will, to help really make these transitions and provide opportunities for nurses to move between hospitals into, into the home and, and back into the community. So I don't have an answer, but I think you're raising a very important futuristic question about how do we hold this space for this emergence to meet the needs of the community, not just the needs of the hospitalized patient. And that's part of nurses' role as well. And when you have a, a large system like Providence Health, you know, this is part of the mission as well. So, you know, it takes the creativity and the ideas from the nursing to actually come up with these new solutions rather than just doing the same old, same old. So you're right where you need to be in asking these kind of questions. Because if you don't ask questions, you can't come up with new possibilities. So it's really important. Thank you. Gene, Mark Walk, I am with Population Health Space, and uh -huh. David and I are on the same page to prior question about in regards to community and everything. But last night we had a um, pretty robust discussion about the social compact and um, all that's going on. And you spoke so eloquently about the paradigm shift. Just interested in more of your thoughts on that concept of the social compact as well. Well, I actually would reframe it as a sacred contract rather than a social contract and you know we talk about social justice but I've actually been referring to it as sacred justice because we're talking about human it's a moral issue it's not just a social issue and nursing holds this core moral foundation for our practice and for our profession so I would actually reframe the social contract as a sacred contract I mean, we did a project in Colorado during the AIDS problem issues where we had a clinic that 
came out of the blue. I mean, we just created it. And it was called the Denver Nursing Project in Human Caring. And we got the community involved. They supported meals and flowers and patients and their family provided pianos and all kinds of, you know, art collection and so forth. It was a clinic on the grounds of the VA hospital, but it was a shared project with what we had at that time, the, the uh, Center for Human Caring with this Denver Nursing Project, the Human Caring Project. So we had AIDS patients and persons with AIDS, persons with HIV positive, and we did full treatment and showed that we were making, saving a million dollars a year by having the, this in the clinic versus having them hospitalized and so forth. So, you know, it's having ex opportunities to experiment with these new projects. One of the things that Stanford is experimenting with is that they're proposing having one whole unit in the hospital that's all run just by nurses. You know, that's an example of a Nightingale unit. Nightingale was very clear about taking charge of the unit for the care. So, you know, we have some new ways of kind of elevating this and experimenting with these futuristic ideas. When you have this vision as consciousness and new possibilities, you are going to come up with some amazing experiences. And then you become the national model because we need other people to show the way. So these projects that are connected with us as affiliates, they're the ones creating the future or you're going to be left behind and you're going to be rolled over because it's changing very quickly. And you know what they say, once you start having this change, it's almost like it flips overnight and people are suddenly in a new consciousness about what they need for healthcare. So thank you. I don't know if I confused you or, or helped, but thank That's you. Very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Jean. I am Joni Dirks, and I am a director for learning operations. And it's inspiring um, having studied your theory while I was in school, and I hear many others sharing that same thing. I'm curious to know if you ha have ideas of how to keep that, that knowledge and that passion alive as we get into practice through the education that we offer our staff. Mm -hmm. I find that a lot of what we do is you know, new equipment, regulatory education, um, not, not really about the, the science of, of caring. So just curious to know if you have any ideas of how to continue that thread once they're into practice. Well, actually hospitals are actually taking this work seriously. Um, they start from day one when you have new people, new staff coming into the system, they orient them to the caring science model and to the care test process. And then it's threaded through all the educational programs they offer. So for example, the director of professional development there is a care test coach and everything they do, and they bring in art and artistry, you know, they use other ways of learning and knowing versus just the cognitive, rational, technical knowledge. They weave it together. So every single educational program, it weaves this kind of care, human caring. And then it's, translated right at the grassroots level of the patient care. And at the, at the unit level, if nurses start sharing their caring moments, they will find evidence of the care task processes among their own experiences. Now, I've already practicing this theory. I just didn't know it. And then it becomes more intentional. It's just not an ad hoc one-off of having a caring moment. It becomes something that you bring to the centerpiece as a professional practice model. So that too is part of it. Now, another project that's happening at Stanford, again, they are spreading this throughout the whole system to all the other members of the, the staff at any level, including secretaries or um, respiratory therapists, all of the different allied health, et cetera. So they have a series of modules that they're doing and offering to all the staff to be Caritas partners as a little designation or a Kertos nurse. They're not necessarily a coach yet, but they're a Kertos nurse at the grassroots level. So some of those kind of educational programs, you can't use knowledge you don't have. So you have to in invite people into education. That's the other part of this. You have to start having a shared consciousness, a shared language, a shared culture about what you're trying to accomplish. And that's part of the vision as consciousness that you invite people in to this shared activity where you're working with something that's coherent and and clear about, but it's larger than yourself. 
and you're contributing something that's part of a whole larger than yourself. That is what inspires people. You know, that's what gets people's heart, <laughs> meaning and purpose in their life. Why are you here? And no, matter, you. no matter what your role is, you have something important. You're here for a reason. I think we need to be reminded of that. Any other questions or comments at this point? I thank you for your questions. They're very beautiful, wise, visionary questions, actually, and comments. Hello, Jean. Uh, I'm Jay Call. I help support our patient experience. And one of the questions for you, and I think we're already have been kind of alluding to it and, and getting pretty close, but I just was curious if you could talk a little bit more, maybe go a little bit deeper into some of the, just some of the outcomes or impact you see on the patient experience, because I, I can assume there's quite a plethora of them. So I was just curious if you could take us a little di deeper into that direction. Right. Well, we can, I can talk about the um, national projects that we have done with the measurement tools with Press Ganey. And we, the original uh, pilot that we did, for example, had an almost direct correlation between some of the uh, personal items and the care, gen care cost, or the five care cost processes that are included in that measurement tool. And I'm also hearing from back from Prescani even now, uh, as this data continues to accumulate, that this these measures are the only measures that really help them drive understand what's driving the patient care experience, particularly during the pandemic. So at another level, these are the only measures they have to capture the patient experience of caring. And so items such as um, the care, uh, care with dignity is one of the most um, statistically significant outcome items. And the healing environment was another one that was statistically significant in terms of the care task processes. And remembering that we are the healing environment, that, that consciousness, our, our intentionality, et cetera. But other things that happen, uh, for example, Stanford has quite a bit of data that they collected in terms of during the pandemic, their retention rate was, uh, was actually improved rather than decreased. So they have really a lot of evidence about the sustainability of their staff. Um, and of course, the patient outcomes are, are real at the highest level. There's a lot of other information. If you go to my, my website, you'll find some uh, uh, videos and some other messages from people like Del Beatty at Stanford uh, speaking about this. And we also have Kaiser Permanente is the largest healthcare system now using this as a formal practice model for several years now. And they have a lot of evidence where they are so committed. They have the goal of having a care task coach on every unit in their hospital. They already have a hundred care task coaches in their system in Northern California in these 21 service areas, but they now are, are, are developing their own program with us to have as many as 181 or something like that. I mean, they have a big vision of, of really transforming self and system through the educational model. So that's another um, way of understanding uh, the, the impact. When you start changing these practice models, using this caring science, you're changing the whole system, basically. I don't know if that helps you with your question. Let me find had another thought about it or not, but those are some of the things that come to my mind. Ms. Watson, this is Kevin McConnick. I, I'm um, responsible for diversity, equity, inclusion for our central division. So glad to hear, you, hear about um, all of your work. Um, I did not study your work because I'm not clinical, uh, but, but, it, but it has been a pleasure listening to you because I, I am a pretty simple person and I'm a boil it all the way down. And I believe that I believe in a lot of what you said today, and I think it has a lot of resonance uh, as it relates to what we talk about in diversity, equity, inclusion, the idea of belonging and those things. And so, you know, there's a there's a um, excerpt from a, a book, um, Robert Fulgram, that talks about everything I need to know about how to be I learned in kindergarten. Yes. And I really do believe pretty wholeheartedly that when it comes to people. Like, you know, we unlearn the things that we we've learned early, early on about how to be if we, you know, most of us had parents taught us. Right. And the thing that resonated with me so much was when you said, um, see, see the people and see their humanity. 
And I, you know, I just kind of wonder from your perspective as it relates to diversity, equity, inclusion, knowing for us, you know, some of our goals are around representation and making sure that we have a workforce that that really uh, looks like who we're serving and those type things, uh, making sure we're creating that space for belonging for all of our caregivers. Kind of kind of can you give a little bit more about your perspective along the lines of how how diversity, equity, inclusion, um, uh, that lens may be really, really important to this work. Well, it's about this shared humanity. And when you hold this higher, con if you have a caritas consciousness, let's say, you would seek, we would seek to see who is that spirit-filled person that goes beyond the color of the skin or their, whatever their condition is. And what is it that is needing, what are they needing for themselves? You seek to work from the subjective life force of the other person rather than ourselves and understand them from that point of view. You know, we think somebody might be uh, disturbed, but if you understand their life story or listening to your story, their story, you would have a, you would probably never have another enemy in terms of understanding the the suffering or whatever the trauma is that that person has gone through and is experiencing right now. So you're not going to be able to solve all these problems, but it's how do we see another person equal this to myself? When I look to you, I see myself in you. That's the ethics of face we're talking about. And that's the ethic that belong, we belong to this higher connection. And when we objectify another person and see them as enemy or see them unlike us, then that's when we start doing unkind things. And this is a serious national global problem because when you start justifying doing something to other as, as other versus like myself, another human being that I need to, un, to honor, then you start totalizing humanity. And then you totalize and objectify another human being. And then you justify doing something to them. And that creates war and all these crises we have of caring in our, in our global issues. So it's, it's, I guess, the terminology of equity, inclusion, et cetera, it brings it to the forefront, but it's something that's core to what we have to be as nurses and have had always, uh, always, but we have not always honored it, even our own profession. I mean, we have stories that are not very kind to the way we've treated black people in particular and so forth. So we have, we're all learning together to elevate the consciousness of our humanity and our shared humanity. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Jean, it's Lori Green again, and hopefully the internet won't break this time. Um, <laughs> listening to the last few questions, I'm wondering if you could share experience uh, of your work uh, being applied in our emergency departments. Going back to your uh, photo that you shared of us or the, the, the graphic you shared, I can see where sometimes in our emergency departments, some caregivers you know, get closed off for various reasons. And that's one thing I've been thinking uh, about just at my own ministry. So I was wondering if you could share any work around that. Well, the emergency room is a complex situation, of course, because many of the people come to the emergency room are not necessarily there for the right, for what we think of as a medical emergency. They might be there for other reasons. And so by being able to connect with that person, having that caring connection in that moment and very being able to quickly assess that other person's frame of reference and what's going on is a real skill set. And actually, this is a both in intensive care and in emergency rooms are very critical, almost like paradigm cases of where you can actually live out this theory. And there's been quite a few uh, research studies about nurses in the emergency room and their ability to actually practice this and the difference it makes as well as in intensive care units. Because again, you're connecting back to the inclusion. You're seeing that other person. One of the, just a little personal story. I got a phone call a while ago from a, a former, um, a close friend of mine that I grew up with and I'd lost track with. And she was at the emergency room with an elderly a patient, a, fan, a neighbor of hers. And the, the, the emergency room was packed and there's all this activity going on. And her neighbor was on a gur gurney in the middle of the hall. 
and people were just back passing her by and the nurses were just ignoring her. And this one nurse kept coming to her and responding to her and, and connecting with her and explaining to her a few things. And she asked the nurse, she said, why, why are you practicing different or why, why are you different than the other nurses? And she says, well, I'm practicing the theory of human caring. And so it's that kind of situation. And another, just recently, I was in Mexico, and I have what I do in those presentations. I invite the public, I mean, the, excuse me, the audience to come up as they volunteer and share their caring moments and the, their experiences in practicing the theory. And this one doctoral student came up to the stage, and she was describing how she was taking care of a terminally ill patient with all these caring healing modalities and this really, you know, lovely care. And her, her peers made fun of her. Says, why are you practicing like that? You don't have to practice. You know, that's the old practice model, just doing the care, just do the care. And she said, she paused and she said, I'm practicing the theory of human care. And then she said to them, what theory are you practicing? It's that consciousness I'm talking about. What theory are you practicing? If you're not practicing something that you can articulate, then you're just going out doing the old doing nursing job of bodies, not taking care of the whole human being. So it's that kind of shift in consciousness we're talking about, whether it's in the emergency room or the intensive care unit, or whether it's in yeah. our own personal life, the way we take care of ourselves. So we have a first responsibility is creating a caring healing environment. One of the hospitals I'm working with they, the leader says, nurse retention is an outdated paradigm. That now nursing leaders have a responsibility to create a culture of caring and healing for the practitioners, so that we're supporting each other. We're not just there, you know, doing the usual automaton kind of structures. And so this too is an opportunity. It's an invitation. It's an open field. It's already out there waiting for us to step into it just you know how is it we're the largest health profession and we're still kind of languishing lingering waiting what are we waiting for it's time but we have to give voice and language and lift it up and inspire all of the participants in it too so i applaud you for being part of this you're part of the evolution of our humanity we're in danger of surviving at the planet as well as the, the human love. We, we know this. Thank you very much, Jean. This is Jennifer again. Thank you, especially for that last response. I, I love the words you used in the challenge of what theory are you practicing and uh, using that question. Um, thank you very much for joining our group today. We really appreciate your time and sharing your work with us and helping us understand how to apply your work to the situation and, and our own practice. Well, Jennifer, thank you. Thank you for your leadership and the privilege of being with you. And I want to close with a Chinese proverb because it's sort of a nice way to bring closure. It's very simple. It's like, if there's light in the soul, there's beauty in the person. If there's beauty in the person, there's harmony in the house. If there's harmony in the house, there's order in the nation. If there's order in the nation, there will be peace in our world. So take your beautiful light and go in peace. And God bless. Thank you so much.